It is the 18th of July, 2022, and it's time for a little morning combat extra credit. Luke Thomas, Brian Campbell, we already gave you the regular MK. Got a surprise little co-host here. I don't normally join this vehicle. That's right. The other dude, as uh, Joe Rogan aptly noted his name was, he's going to join me today. We're going to go, as we normally do, 30 minutes or less, five other fights from the weekend that we did not get to on regular MK. We'll get to them here. BC, you got any questions for me? I just want to see if the guys in the back could turn the sound off of them, like, talking to each other so we can do the show. Playing Fortnite while we're doing this? (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get a new skin, yeah. go. Thumbs up on the video if you're watching. Please hit subscribe. If you're listening on a podcast podcast platform, give us a nice review. This UFC Long Island card delivers. Liver. It certainly did. One quick point about that. We'll start there, actually, BC. We didn't really talk about it so much on regular MK. First things first, before we get to the five fights that we normally do for extra credit here, the podcast within the podcast, I was saying that these like these these fight night cards on the road are like little Goldilocks cards. Yes. Because the ones at the Apex are a little too cold. The UFC 276 is a little too hot. This is right in the middle. And, yes, the main event was a bit of a dud in the way that it ended <clears> in that sense. But, dude, these cards on the road, Austin, this one, London this weekend, I got a good feeling about, they seem to be winners. I don't think it's a surprise that New York-based fight cards in boxing or MMA tend to deliver great fight fans. You know, Luke, being a Northeast guy, tri-state area mm. guy like myself, I think I can sit in the middle of that and be happy. We talked to UFC uh, representatives, and we were in Vegas for UFC 276, and they seemed to give us the indication there's going to be a lot more stuff on the road in 2023. Yeah. You don't you know. see them going to D.C. much, I'll tell you that. Okay? They, did, well, they went recently. They went right before the pandemic. Where? Fairfax? That was when um, uh, Overeem fought Rosenstrike. At the, uh, at the, I guess at the time it was the Verizon Center, but now it's the uh, Cap One Arena. Anyway, neither here nor there. Okay, five fights for you here to start today's. Five for fighting. Five fights today to start today's show. I'm hoping that BC doesn't derail everything. Let's start with the co-main event from the weekend, a women's strawweight battle. <laughs> I mean, you're such a jerk. I mean, you really are. You know? Amanda Lemos defeating Michelle Waterson, yes. BC. This happened at 148 of round two via guillotine choke. Waterson shot for a takedown. It got defended. Lemos came on top and then got the guillotine jump for it, and that was a wrap. We had talked about it on Friday's show that this was her chance to, yeah, she was losing to the uh, J-Checks and whatnot. This was a chance to beat someone who was actually outside the top ten. And she couldn't get it done. Your takeaway is what? Here's what's hard about this. And it's hard to sort of judge the same harshness we did on the main show. I'm talking about Misha Tate. It's a little bit different situation, of course. But we said Larson coming in, being in this great level of shape, no stones unturned. If she can't save it now, she'll never be able to save it. She actually looked good for some of You know what I mean? She looked in great shape. She looked good. And then it just didn't go her way. But it's not one of those disastrous losses in a vacuum in itself. She fought a very good fighter who's rising and she came up empty. She ended up tapping out. But in the totality of the losses, it's hard to sit here and be like, all right, just go to the back to the drawing board again. But that's essentially what she said in a video to her fans on, on Instagram, I believe, uh, you know, in the 24 hours that followed it. And you would say, this isn't somebody that you're looking at going, you're doing a disservice to yourself outside of the, the succession of losses. She still looks pretty damn hungry in game. But she's not, she's not getting around that right. turn. She, she, didn't not, get, she didn't get her ass kicked. She didn't get fully beat up. This was not some thrashing. In fact, you could maybe argue, I haven't seen the scorecards, but certainly she had, I think, a takedown in round number one. There was a lot of striking at distance where she was hitting nothing but air, which is a little bit of her, sort of her M.O. But you're right. She didn't get thoroughly dominated in some kind of troubling way. Yeah, Misha Tate was getting lit up. I felt bad That's watching right. it. Very, very different scenario. However, you're looking for her to like get back in the winner's circle, do something that would separate her from her contemporaries, and it just didn't really work out that way. Lemos, by the way, really smart to always, we talk, you know, I, I mentioned this on the post-fight show, if you have a wrestling coach and you shoot and it fails, they'll tell each other person the next best thing to do is shoot again, reshot, reshot, yeah. reshot, reshot. And so here, it was Lemos turning defense into offense, stuffing the shot, and then jumping the guillotine when most people think you're just going to disengage. Great presence of mind. Watterson didn't have an answer for it. It doesn't make her a bad fighter by any stretch of the imagination, but I'm waiting to see something that lifts her. Yes. I've not seen that. And, you know, she's still got the hunger, and that's great, but she's going to have to be a gatekeeper name for others to, to sort of test themselves against at this point. It's, it's in that territory now. You hate to see that, but that's where it's at. She's still fresh enough where I am not wouldn't advise her to go away, but... It's like, how many more? Lo- Could there be another loss? Could she get another opportunity against a decent name in a certain spot? Maybe because of her name and because of how game she still is, but you're only going to be able to tolerate, whether you're matchmakers and management or fans, so many losses in a row. And it's tough to see because she's somebody that works so hard and she's in there. But this is, should be more about Amanda Lemos. Luke, in a division with all killers like women's uh, strawweight, you, you have to show something plus to your game for us to take you serious as a legitimate title contender. Marina Rodriguez has shown that to a large degree. Uh, 
what's her name? Uh, has, Mackenzie Dern has certainly showed a plus side to her game that if she can potentially grab onto it and find it, she could be a factor. Yao Shanan to a different degree. Do you think Amanda Lemos is showing that right now? She certainly is, and I think obviously her she has a ton of finishes on her record. The only thing that is holding her back is time. She's thirty five. Yeah. She's thirty five. So that to me is one critical element where like it was this was an important win for her to get. She got a win, but via finish, she's off to the races. But she doesn't have, in my judgment, a lot of time to make mistakes. Right? She got beat by Andrade. Okay, fair enough. You, that was what it was. That was a crazy win by Andrade, and she had shown incredible strength. I guess I'm just sort of saying this was a nice win, but you really got to keep it going because I don't know how many more of these are going to be as time expires um, and, and the best of your athleticism leaves you. And oh, by the way, can you show some respect to the family and call her Watterson Gomez? Watterson Gomez, that's right. That's Thank her you. new name. All right, jumping down the card here, I'll be curious to hear how you scored it. Shane Burgos defeats Charles Jordan via majority decision, 29-28 on two judges' scorecards, and then won 28-28. There was the card that was troubling, BC, was they gave round two to Burgos as a 10-8, but then yes. they gave round three to Jordan. That was the 28-28 right, card. As a 10-9. Not my favorite scorecard in the world. Dude, in the this world. is a what the hell were you watching? Look, if you wanted to give Jordan a 10-8 in round three, right, you can go, okay, right? It was kind of falling apart for Burgos. How did I score it? Two rounds to one. I thought Burgos won one and two. Two was, was uh, one of the two were closer than the other. But to give 10-8 in either of the first two rounds is just you don't know what you're watching, right? I even think the a 10-8— The first one was reasonably close-ish. Yeah, and I think a 10-8 in the third round for Jordan would even have been a little too aggressive. No, he did dominate it start to finish. I don't think necessarily that he was, like, ragdolling Burgos. But that's his troubling scorecard. At least the right guy won it because, in theory, this was a matchup between two guys, both very tough, which one's coming or going. To see Shane Burgos dig in and say— I want a new contract. I'm coming. I'm not going. And then get the win, and I think rightfully so. Outside of him having to hang on and bite down in the third, this was a pretty strong performance overall. His striking was crisp. He may take on more damage than you would want for somebody at this level, but I really like this Shane Burgos performance, Luke. Well, It got hairy in the third, yes, but I don't get that third scorecard, and I thought this was survive in advance. Let's get into another big fight. You know, I, usually I'm not one of these guys who, when someone's like, oh, neither guy lost stock, I'm like, eh, one guy lost stock. In this case, I'm actually not so sure that Jordan lost stock for two reasons. One, I thought that Burgos is grappling and like pushing off the <clears> fence <throat> to take the back. I thought that was great. Like we always talk about the fact that he's got well-rounded skills and then he just decides to box in the pocket. Well, this time he decided to do a little bit more than boxing in the pocket. I really appreciated that, although it kind of cost him the grappling cost him because he couldn't really move because his legs were fried. So Jordan came back big time in the third and was putting it on him. But nevertheless, did Shane Burgo show you he's more than just a guy who's willing to brawl in the pocket and have those kinds of boxing affairs? Yes, he did, and it won him the contest. Love that. Sometimes guys have to hang on. Zabit versus Calvin Cater in round three. Sometimes you got to hang on. It doesn't mean necessarily that you're compromised, that, that, that you know what I mean? The other guy had a better round. He and also, like, he would probably use this experience to calibrate how much grappling should I do and yes. what kind of way should I apply it going forward. Learning experience, he still gets the dub. That's important. In the case of Charles Jordan, it didn't look like he fully believed he could win in yes. round one. But by round three, he knew he could win. Well, he also had to. And he, and he had up. to. And, and he, he had to. Up. But I got to tell you, like, did Charles Jordan show me that he has what it takes to compete against the top 15 in that division? 100% featherweight, obviously. Yes. yes, he did. Did he show you that as well? He did, but it's a work in progress. Right? And that, that's fair to say at this point. Yeah, this I is a tough loss against a tough competitor. Now, do you think there's people that are arguing that he should have won? Is that what you sort of were trying to— Some people—okay, I don't mind a scorecard that's either— Dude, I, this, is, this is the art of judging, the reality. Is a draw conceivable? Yes. Is a scorecard for Jordan conceivable? Yes. Is a scorecard for Burgos one that I personally agree with? Yes. I also am with you. I would have either gone 10 nines across the board or I would have given a 10 8 in round three yes. to Jordan, which, would which have made it 28 the, yes. the right way. And now we got there the wrong way, unfortunately. Right. So, I, so it's not that I mind <clears throat> the scorecards in that sense. I saw people being like, Jordan was robbed. He was not robbed. It's not a robbery. If it's a close fight and it comes down to one round going one way or the other, it's not a fucking draw. I do agree that the way which the 10 8 versus the 10 9 was apportioned is a head scratcher. That part to me is a little bit That's weird. That's why I really wish that referees and judges were had to show up at the post-fight press conference, had to take that stand and, and just at least defend themselves. Because a lot of these times we're like, oh, that scorecard is so bad, they must be uh, you know taking money, ignorant, blah, blah, blah. Well, sometimes they may be seeing things under a... Look, we've, we talked about the scoring structure. 
use, stop using the word damage. The word is impact. Impact can be gauged in different ways. So if someone's putting out a scorecard like this, let's find out why. And if it exposes them, then it exposes them. But if not, wouldn't that better answer the questions than just going, oh, this, every time it happens in boxing, we go, oh, this sport is corrupt and stupid. Mm -hmm. Is boxing corrupt and stupid? Yes. In a lot of ways, yeah, of course it is. So unfortunately, this reinforces something that in a lot of these cases, it may not be if you just, like, like that, who was that first base umpire who blew that perfect gamer no-hitter about 10 years ago? Do you remember that? Vaguely, it was a close yeah. play at first. Vaguely. It was the Tigers were involved, and afterwards, he was like crying. He was like, I blew it. You know, he, he stood up. He took that out. He was willing to do dead wrong, morningcombat at gmail.com. He was. Let's get these commissions to do the same thing. Yeah, or just issue some kind of, write one paragraph <clears throat> about why you judge the fight. It's some kind of indication for what you saw and why you saw it the way that you did. Give us a little bit of direction about why it went that way. Because I have judges I have personal relationships with that yeah. will tell me things off the record, but I want something on the record about this. I will say the good news, Burgos has apparently resigned with UFC, yes. so he's going to be back for more. He was going to keep his top 15 ranking position. I think it was 14 or 15 heading into this. So Make a fight for him. Calvin Cater? That's a little bit too far apart. A little bit too far I'm apart. looking at the rankings. Give me an in-between featherweight fight. So the fe um, Ilya Topuria? Oh, boy. Edson Barboza, Sadiq Youssef, Dan Ige, somewhere in there. Okay, I'm in. Any, I'm in. any of those. The Dan Ige fight in particular would be very good. I, I would I would have. I just want to let the world know I would have Shane Burgos on that couch. I would. That's me talking. Because he's a real man. Uh, he certainly is. Although that hair of his, was, it was all over the place. I don't hate it. Uh, all right, so let's go down to the preliminary card. BC, what do you say about this guy? What a performance to me. We, we, I, I wish the regular morning combat was longer so we'd have more time to talk about it. How about Ricky Simone defeating Jack fucking Shore? 328 of round number two via arm triangle choke. Dude, this was amazing by Ricky Simone. It was one-way traffic, Totally right? slept on. He came in there, did what he had to do, hurt him on the feet, finished him off on the ground. This is a black belt in jiu-jitsu. This is nobody's fucking bitch. Jack Shore is very, very good. Ricky Simone finally got rid of the mullet. What did you make of his performance? Yeah, I, people, I got the wrong info. The people telling me the mullet was back, they were wrong. I was wrong. I was wrong about him. I said, go Jack Shore. In fact, did you see Ariel tweeting minutes before that fight started of saying this is like the real co-main event? Why is it buried on the prelim card like this? I don't disagree with him in that regard, although those tweets were, were definitely shot in the direction of a potential Shore win. I thought Shore would good win to see Simone jump through the screen with his control of this fight, with his, with his body, first of all. Dude, he's like in next level shape at the moment. Yeah, he's in. I mean, sick he's shape. you know it, it's back day every day. It seemed like for him, he is jacked up. He almost had Bilal Muhammad type pe pecs. So right? remember, remember the nipple on that, right? You know what I mean? Remember the name. Okay, you don't um, have to ruin this podcast. Just the analysis will work. All right, analysis wise, just the confidence was surging, the commitment to the ground game, and just the the, the next level stuff he added onto it. The aggression was next level. Everything about it, you saw the motivation. He realized he was potentially going to be fodder for a guy that was coming on with a big audience behind him and Jack Shore, and he humbled him, Luke. And that was a breakthrough performance. It's not that Ricky Simone hasn't looked good before. It's not that anyone holds a loss to old man Faber against him. It's part of the journey in climbing. But, Luke, he's kicked the doors open. He's ready for the next level, and it was great to see that. Yeah, he's got two losses in the UFC. He has a loss to Faber, as you indicated, via TKO. This was all the way back in 2019, so about three years. Yeah, July of 2019, so um, about three years ago. Actually, July 13th, almost three years to the day. And then uh, Rob Font. He has a decision loss to Rob Font. But since then, he beat Ray Borg, some dude named Gaetano Borrelio. I don't know how you pronounce this dude's name. But then he really begins to turn it. Brian Kelleher and then Rafael Sunsau. And you're like, okay, Kelleher's very good, but he can be a little bit up and down. A Sunsau... A little bit long in the tooth, even though at one time he was very good. But but a tough out is. But Jack Shore, to me, this one, the reason why this stands out is because Jack Shore, undefeated heading into this, a ton of promotion in the UK market from Wales, obviously. Black Bone Jiu-Jitsu, what he had shown in his previous contest is the ability to, yeah, sometimes the guys might win around, but he is very good about, for the most part, controlling, making good decisions, getting to positions where he needs to, applying the pressure and the right kind of offense when it calls for it. Just made really, really smart decisions. And I thought that Ricky Simone, we, I knew he was better physically, which he's going to be better physically than most guys. Remember, he beat Rob in that crazy-ass contest that they had. Anybody who can go you know, race for race, so to speak, oh, with yeah. Marab has got an amazing gas tank. But I, I wanted to see, could he be more than just a physical bruiser? Yeah. And in this contest, dude, he outstruck him, basically, and then finished him off on the ground like that. That, to me, told me this guy's got serious potential. But as just a the body language, it's different now, Luke. It's different now. He, he believes in himself. He, he, crawled, he turned a corner uh, internally. You can see it. You can tell. On the flip side, humbling for Jack, sure. Yes. But, you know, how nervous 
should, should the Jack Shore super fans be? Not very. 27 years old. This is his first loss. And before this one, recall who he had beaten. He had beaten Timur Vilev, who I have a, like, yes. as a very good fighter. It's not like he uh, – yes, the other ones he had beaten. Hunter Azure was a split. Okay, that's not the highest of the high. Uh, and then some other dudes that, you know, from the Contender Series or whatever. No, sorry. He beats um, Noel Ian Hernandez. Yes, that's not the most impressive win by any stretch. But, but, Ricky Simone, to me, to beat a guy this quality – Says a lot, and if you're 27, you're not even in your prime yet. Yes. You have time to get better, to work on this. The one thing I will say is Jack Shore's style to me, it's very cerebral. He's very well-rounded. Again, this is a very good fighter, but I think this might be a bit of a wake-up call for him because there's some physical powerhouses yes. in the UFC, and I think there's a certain degree of intensity exactly. he didn't bring to he this match it. that he needs to bring. Physicality even, just that, that next level sort of like, okay, long-term, being technical is going to be the best thing for him. But there's going to be some matchups against some people on the right night that can just outwork you and outstrong you, and that's kind of what happened here. He got outwilled in a lot of ways. Closest fight for, for early stretches, but it was pretty much all Ricky Simone. And to get the finish, Luke, on top of that? Yeah. Damn. And I thought he wasn't going to get it. I thought he Damn. was going to threaten and get out of it. He must, got a, he must have a we now have to. We now have to take him very seriously now after yeah, a win looking, like this. Where does he get the, These are not the updated rankings, so I don't know where he sits at the moment. Let's see. But it currently at bantamweight. Uh, Ricky Simone is only sitting at 13, and Sean O'Malley sitting at 12, and he called out Sean O'Malley. You like that fight? I love that call out. I got to tell you, that's I, a tough fight for Sean O'Malley. It's a tough fight for both of them, and that's why you love Good it right point. now. Yeah. That's why you love it right now. And, and, and if you're Ricky Simone and you want to get taken seriously and you want to be a star, yeah, call out that guy. Call out the guy that could probably give you the largest audience right now, short of fighting a top three guy, you know, a Dillashaw, a champion on that level, short of getting to that group, and he's not there yet. The best move to make a giant leap would be to go through O'Malley. It really would. So yeah, I don't know if O'Malley's going to take it, given he was getting top five or top ten ranked guys before, and this yeah. is a little bit outside of that. But would I love to see it? I would love Who's to Marab see Who's Marab fighting? Doesn't he have a fight coming out? Uh, he's fighting Aldo. Oh, good Lord, I love that one. I forgot about <laughs> yeah. that one. Yes, that is. Oh, August 20th. Whew. He's, gonna, he's fighting Aldo. All right, we moved Salt down. Lake City. Yeah, we moved down the list. So how about this one? Bill Algeo, or Algeo, I'm not sure how you pronounce it exactly, defeating Herbert Burns, second round, 150. Now, they called it retirement. I had seen a guy previously refuse to get up. I was actually at the fight. It was when Kimbo Slice fought James Thompson. Matt Sarah has a little brother named Nick Sarah. Nick Sarah was getting leg kicked or something and just refused. He was sitting on the ground. Ref tells, tells him to get up, and he just refused, so they waved it. This was not that. He apparently had injured his knee. But BC, I tell you what I love about Bill Algeo. I love guys who get really badly threatened. That triangle that Herbert Burns had would have finished 99 yes. other percent of featherweights. Algeo stuck it out and then goes back into the mouth of the lion to fight him that way. I got to tell you. Love the guts Love it. on Bill Algeo. There were a lot of balls on this card. Maybe it was the crowd spurning people on. We saw that amazing Chanel uh, Sumadarvi uh, fight. Sumadarji. Sumadarji. I almost nailed it. Um, it carried over into this one. Big balls. Algeo got it done. But, like, when this fight fell apart and then it was over, it was kind of shocking. It was kind of like, oh, shit, it's over. Uh, what do you mean? The implosion. The, oh, yeah. The, the, oh, he's not going to get up. You know, of course, an injury in the end, and no one's going to question the heart of a Burns brother. I mean, you know, Gilbert's an absolute savage, and it has probably carried out throughout around in his family, but you get that picture of Gilbert carrying his brother out. It kind of went in that direction. It, I'm not saying it was million-dollar baby-like in terms of how the plot just fell apart and went there, went yeah. down that road to, like, I, I didn't ask to be here. Why am I here? But it kind of felt like it in this fight. You, uh, you didn't come with us to Extreme Couture, so it was me. Yeah, I wasn't asked. Well, we thought you were working. I mean, you know, you're like I've got a lot of do I got a lot of writing to do. Unlike you scrubs. So we're like, okay. So we went to Extreme Couture when BC had to do some writing and we saw Bill there actually. And um, I wonder if he's trying to make a name for himself and fought that way a little bit, right? Because I remember Eric Nixick was taking me around and you know, introducing me to a bunch of people. And Bill was very, very nice, but he was like, I just don't know the names of a lot of media guys. And not that he's trying to impress the media per se, but I get the sense with this win. And this sort of like this the swag that he's got. Do you think he fought him this way as a way to stand out? Because he could have fought him sticking and moving and getting away and playing prevent defense. Dude, he went right into the buzzsaw instead. Probably did. I mean, sometimes you have to do that to make that noise. If you're not the kind that's going to make the noise with the mouth sort of artificially to get attention to your side, sometimes you need a breakthrough performance like that. Look at work. The timing was perfect. Um, we've seen him against Billy Q, right? Didn't they? Ever? So they are supposed to have the battle of the Billies. In fact, Billy Q tweeted me. Didn't they already fight or no? Uh, I don't think think so. Well, let me double check. Yeah, check that. Wrong. I thought I thought Billy Q has a win over him. I could be completely making it up, Luke. I sometimes have... Uh, yeah, you're making it up. I am making you're it up. You're making right. it up. 
He's got losses to Ricardo Hamosh, to Ricardo Lamas, to oh. Brendan Lochnan on the Contender Series. This is who the who got beat. Oh, yeah. Brendan Lochnan beat him. And, I didn't realize the know. connection there that that was the same guy. Uh, right. Then Jared Gordon in the regional scene and Shane Burgos on the regional scene, okay. actually. So there's a bunch of guys you could actually have rematches with him there. And that's some, some some kind of validation, I suppose, for Brendan Lockton, by the way. Is Randy Couture still connected in any form with the Extreme Couture? Yeah, he is. In fact, I asked uh, Eric Nixick about it. He said that when Randy's in town, he's there almost every day. Now, But, like, financially and business-wise, is he, is he connected? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Yeah, I think so. Um, so, so anyway, the point I'm trying to make here is this was a really nice win for Bill Definitely. Algeo. Very impressive. We knew he's a black belt in jiu-jitsu, so we could kind of see it coming. But, you know, the guys he had beaten before BC, Spork, Spike Carlisle, the best TV fighter there is. But, you know. Absolutely. Uh, you know, if you're big into conspiracy theories, you're... That's the fight I'm thinking of. I, I, I swapped Billy Q in there because Billy Q also fought Spike Carlisle, but you're saying Bill Algeo fought... Um, yeah, if I, fought, he hasn't okay. fought him yet. And then he, the, the last <clears> one <throat> against Joe Anderson Brito, which is a nice win, but doesn't tell you a whole lot. Herbert Burns, by the way, what do you want to say about Herbert Burns at this point? So he's sitting at 34 years of age. This might be another ACL tear. He's lost two Tough in a row, one to Daniel Pineda, one to this one. He was giving Bill Algeo the business, or at least it looked like he was, but Algeo... Never wavered. Prior to this, he had beaten uh, Evan Dunham, your favorite, Nate Landwehr, and then Derek Minner. He's got some good wins, too, but... But he's kind of in Frank Stallone territory right now. A little bit, yeah. yeah. You know, Diego Lima, Lima's been there, too, right? You know, you're sort of the brother of the, of the really fighter who's a little bit more ahead and famous. The Ozzy Canseco, Luke, we can go on and on. But uh, tough loss, tough... Uh, is it a damaging loss? Beyond the physical No, damage? I don't know how damaging... Well, beyond the what happened to his knee. I don't see that it bumped his stock down... But it does make you wonder, like, okay, at 34 years of age, now facing a potentially devastating knee injury, what is even really possible at this yes. point? That's sort of the issue uh, versus, like, do I think he can beat good fighters? Yes. If he's healthy, I, I very much think he can beat good fighters. I just don't know what's – time is not on his side is basically no. the point I'm trying to make. Who, uh, in, in your combination with your brother, which one of you is the Marty Gennetti? Like, which one of you is the Dan Miller to the Jim Miller? So, growing up, I was definitely the Dan to the gym. Okay. My brother was, you know, I did I did well uh, on, like, standardized tests, but I had, And like, with women, and he's not, but it, the tables have turned. Now you are Valentina, and he's, and he's El bit. Pantera. Yeah, switched a little bit in okay. that way. Take um, that, brother. But he definitely, in high school, he was definitely the man. I was not, but... In, a, in an switched. athletic sense or a debate team sense? In a debate team sense. Okay. My I mean, brother, look, it's gotten you brothers very far in life. Yeah, dude. Dude, my brother was my brother did really, really well. <clears throat> and you know, as you always say to me, when I ever attempt to throw stones at the glass house that was your fraternity, mm -hmm. where were you during this time, BC? Dropping out, <laughs> working at the old folks' home. Okay, remember that time I found that bag of purple haze weed in the drain at the old folks' home? You just fucking smoked. You're that damn thing. right, I did. Yes, <laughs> I did. Okay. That's awesome. Yeah. All right, how about this one? This one opened the card. I don't know if you saw it or not, BC. I had my eye on this one because I've been following Emily Ducati's career for a while. She took on Jessica Penny. She wins 29-28 in two of the judges' scorecards, 30-27. Boy, she chewed Jessica Penny's leg to pieces. This was her UFC debut for Ducati. She's How technical. Were you? She's very, Emily Ducati, very, very technical, stuck to her game plan. Penny, who still got a little bit left in the tank and was trying to bring it out in certain moments. I really like the game plan. Um, doesn't seem to be a lot of finishing power there, Luke. More of more of a slick boxer, but in terms of her actual boxing, head movement, the the angles and stuff, she knows what she's doing there. This was an impressive win to sort of get her feet wet here. Now, obviously, you're going to climb the ladder at strawweight. You're going to be fighting good fighters time after time. But I got to give her credit for this. For opening fight of the night, debut, came in there and handled her business well. Never got compromised or damaged. I mean, it was a good performance. Well, there's a Bellator shout-out during the broadcast <clears throat> when she competed, which I didn't hear in real time. I only heard of the, on the second time around. DC also mentioned PFL. He brought up Pettis losing his rib. See, that's not the, surprising yeah. because PFL is on ESPN. True. I didn't think Anik was going to mention Bellator, but he did. Now, if you look, go back to her Bellator career, that's when I began to take notice of her. She fought Elaine Malay McFarlane when Elaine Malay was kind of ahead of the pack, and she was not. For so the she, inaugural featherweight title. She has her, two, she has two losses. She has two yeah. losses to Elaine Malay McFarlane. And then Vita Ortega, she got bounced on the promotion after that. She lost three in a row in Bellator. And then she went on the regional scene, then kind of rebounded a little bit in Invicta, and then got a win over Juliana Lima in her last, excuse me, uh, and then prior to the, excuse me, subsequent to that, Danielle Taylor. That was that insane viral knockout. Where she hit her with a punch, froze her, and then head kicked her, or was it head kicked her, froze her, and then punched her? Whichever one it was, it was this incredible sequence. Um, 
Actually, then she beat uh, Alicia Zapatella, who was the uh, strawweight champion for them. I think she even went down to Adam. I'm not, I can't keep up with Invicta. You can't. This was her UFC it. debut. I wasn't sure how she was going to look. She is massively improved. Yes. From her Bellator days. Majorly. I mean, her boxing is as good as anyone's. She was slipping punches. I don't, I don't know if that means that she's going to climb this ladder and get a bunch of wins. She's going to try. But in terms of just her, her, her technique and foundational element, she's a very good boxer. And you don't see that a lot, you know, in that level. For Jessica Penny, a bit of a weird spot. She was a standout prior to the UFC really going all in on getting the women in there. But she lost four years of her career to like a USADA and an yes. injury issue. She's now 39 years of age. Uh, and she had, now prior to this, BC, this is the funny part about it. She had won two prior to this. She beat Lupita Godinez. Okay. And then she armbarred Carolina Kovalkiewicz in August of 2021, which got her a performance of the night bonus. But you're losing <laughs> to someone who made their UFC debut and it wasn't really close. She got chewed up. So what do you do, Carolina, rematch? I'm not sure what you do with Jessica Penny. Again, I think back in the day when she was beating in Invicta, when she was beating, you know, the Lisa Ellis's of the world back in 2012, dude, she made her pro debut in fucking 2006, Who did she beat consecutively to get the title shot against Ioana? She beat, uh, she lost to Michelle Waterston in Invicta, and then she beat uh, Nick Dali Rivera Kalanick, I don't know how you say her name. Then she went on to the Ultimate Fighter. I don't know how she did on that one, but then in the finale, she beat Randa Marcos, and then she got a title shot right after that. Oh, okay, and then so that was, that was early. Her. And I don't mean to disparage her. I'm just saying, like, she didn't have the breakthrough when you would have needed. That was the third title fight. And, and she had a rough back to back stretch because she had to fight Joanna, and then she had to fight Andrade, and Andrade Yikes. TKO'd her. That was on that 199 card with Bisping Rockhold. Yep. And so you're like, okay, we lost to those two. But then she lost to Daniel Taylor, who Ducati just knocked out not too long ago. And so the point I'm trying to make is, I, after she lost to that, I was like, oh, well, that's a clear downgrade from Andrade. I don't think Daniel Taylor's even in the UFC anymore. And then she lost four years. But then she came back to beat Godinez and Karol Kovacavich. There obviously still is some life left in her. But I think getting back to a title picture is probably not in the cards. No. Probably not in the cards. But for Ducati, this was great. A really great win. Uh, any honorable mentions you want to give? You want to talk about the leech real quick? Yeah, I mean, look, that's the type of comeback win you would want to see him after the destructive nature. I mean, it was it was beyond one-sided against Hamza Chemaev. I mean, he got picked up and right, slammed right in yeah, front of the cage and, and taunted. To see him come back and, and fight that, I don't want to say that technical for a guy that, that powerful Dude, and destructive. He was busier, yet and I he was better. He mixed in some craft to set it up, and then once it was time to go, he'll get you out of there. He'll get you the hell out of there. The thing about Salikov is I'm not going to say he's gimmicky, but his spinning attacks didn't work. Yeah. And when they didn't work, what was the best shot he landed outside of it? Not not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. It's some stuff. But you had a much more conventional game. And I even talked about this on my post-fight show. If you look at the distribution of where he targeted the leech, it was basically 30% on the head, body, and leg. Now, of course, you don't need to do that. You, that's not like the right way versus the wrong way. But get, going against a guy who's got a, 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 a sort of a weird skill set and you need to bring all of your tools to bear – the fact that he targeted that evenly tells you he was trying to use all of his weapons in a smart and complete way. It I really appreciated that from him. It readjusted our understanding of what his ceiling could be. You thought coming in he may have been closer to it, Luke, right? Yeah, that's right. Last but not least, I'm going to give a shout-out to Dustin Jacoby. Dude, how about this fucking guy? So I covered his career when he was in glory. He actually fought Pereira back in the day. And, you know, his first UFC run did not go well. He got beat by Clifford Starks, who was a, sort of a big wrestler. He got beat, beat, beat by Chris Camozzi. They might even be, like, teammates at this point. Then he went on, to, like, you know, uh, some of the smaller shows, lost to David Branch, fought on World Series of Fighting 1, was in Bellator, lost two times in Bellator to Muhammad Lawal and John Salter. This was back in 2014 or so. And then took some time away and was doing kickboxing and whatever from 2015 on. Goes back to MMA in 2020 in the Contender Series. Fights Ty Flores, wins. Here are his wins since then. Justin Ledette, Maxine Grishin. He had the no contest, or the, the draw against Ayan Kutelaba. Then he has a TK over Darren Stewart. He beat John Allen. He beat Michael uh, Elekchik, or however you say his name. And now he viciously knocks out, although he kind of walked away to sell it, the, uh, the fight over Da Un Jung. Seven, let's see, how many wins in a row in UFC? So if you count Contender Series, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven wins now, one draw. Do you Dude, think this fucking guy is that? on his way. 
he is on his way. I don't, I don't mean to derail what you're saying about Jacoby here, but do you think they should count contender series wins? It's a pro. It's a pro win. They don't count it currently under your UFC ledger in the same way. Whereas tough wins are exhibitions that they don't count. Uh, Dana White contender series wins are pro actual pro. wins, yeah. but they don't count it under your UFC ledger. It's like it's a separate league. That's weird because it's a pro contest. Well, you're you're going to have to talk to Dana about that. Just, the a, they, if they count it as a separate promotion, then that would be why, but... Um, in any case, who are I, your three? Look at this whole card. Yeah. I don't know if this is the future of extra credit where you end with Luke's three stars, but yeah. who gets your three stars for this whole card? For the ones we just talked about? No, for the whole card in general. Who, are the, who is the most impressive? Not necessarily in terms of stakes, but just in terms of impressive. Schnell. Schnell gets a, gets a star, okay. Murphy. Oh, wow. Simone. Those are my three. What about you? Yeah. Here's the, here's the list right here. Okay, it's, it, this is going to be pretty easy here. Uh, Amanda Lemos. Schnell. Ricky Simone. Ricky Simone. Yeah. There it is. I, I agree with a lot of that. Those are good wins. Ricky Simone, to me, the big standout from the prelim card. He had the biggest win of everyone on the prelim card. Very, very, very high level win for him. All right. That is it for extra credit. That's Brian Campbell. I'm Luke Thomas. Yeah, I'm not normally here in this. In this yeah, he may not be here ever again. Who's to say? But if you want more of this, thumbs up on the video, hit subscribe, morningcombat at gmail.com to reach the producers. You guys know the whole thing. And that is it. We'll be back next week when we react to the following weekend's fights. And until then, this enjoy the fights. About. This is what it's all about.